Namaste everyone. Welcome to Hindu Swami Sevak Sons uh, Stories of Transformation by Group 1. We welcome Dr. R. Balasubramaniam. We're really happy to have you here. Our mentor for this project is the respected Satyaprakash Jai Ramji. He lives, he currently lives in San Jose, California. The moderators for today's interview are Nikhil and Samriddhi. The other members in our team are Jajat Gupta, Ashni Bhatwadekar, Anika Kulkarni, Aditi Mandale, Bhavyashi Navnitha Krishnan, and Vanchika Joshi. A little bit about the Stories of Transformation project. Stories of Transformation is a project that researches, recognizes, and appreciates the efforts of the changemakers all over the world. This project aims at motivating the interns to research and write articles about the changemakers so that the interns can also imbibe the best qualities and contribute to the welfare of the society that they live in. Now let's learn a bit about bit more about Dr. Balu. Dr. Balu's full name is Dr. Ramaswamy Padasubramaniam. He lives in Karnataka, India. He did master's in public administration, MPhil in hospital and health systems management, postgraduate certificate in health and family welfare management, and MBBS graduate in medicine and surgery. He was a visiting professor in many universities and taught many students about leadership and public service. Dr. Baluji was appointed as member Human Resource or Capacity Building Commission of the Government of India. He also authored many different books. Some of the books include Leadership Lessons for Daily Living, Voices from the Grassroots, I the Citizens, and Swami Vivekananda as I See Him, and many more. He was inspired by reading books written by Swami Vivekananda and founded the organizations Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, SVYM, Grassroots Research and Advocacy Movement, GRAM. Some of the recognitions that Dr. Balu was awarded are the Swachya Seva Ratna Award, Jayendra Saraswati Award, Vivekananda Award for Human Excellence, State Youth Award, and many more. A bit about the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement. The motive of this organization is building a new civil society in India. They have built many hospitals and schools for the rural poor. This project was started in 1984 and has more than 30 projects, sub-projects, which help, have helped almost 3 million people across the state of Karnataka. They focus on education, health, socioeconomic empowerment, and have a training and research sector. The Grassroots Research and Advocacy Movement, GRAM, is an organization that examines and analyzes the impact of government policy and communicates the needs of the rural people to the government and helps the needs to be met through various schemes. GRAM was founded in 2011 and they focus on advocating the needs of the people to the government and researching the effect of government schemes and policies on the local people. Now let's talk with Dr. Baluji to understand more about himself and his work. Namaste, Dr. Baluji, and Namaste. welcome to our, thank you for coming to this interview. Uh, so could you please tell us a bit about, uh, a, more, a bit more about SVYM and what the aim of SVYM is? Well, SVYM, I see it is essentially not as an organization, it's actually a platform, I believe, where young people can rediscover their own inner potential. And for too long, like Swami Vivekananda mentioned, you know, he says two things. One thing he says is, my faith is in the younger generation. It's easy to say that, but the rest of society has to also recognize it. But more importantly, young people have to recognize it, right? We got to believe that we are worthy of that faith. We got to believe that we have the power and potential inside us to make a difference. Because most of the time, if you look at the Indian context, we grow up being told stories of what we cannot do and should not do. I think it's time this nation's great civilizational ethos was always about telling young people what they can do. It's not just stories of Nachiketa that matters to us. It's also becoming the Nachiketa that matters to us. 
And I think parents have an obligation and responsibility as much as society to tell young people that you are capable of doing what you want to do. And SPYM is a platform that provides them this uh, space to actually explore themselves and through that exploration, get to do something with the societally good. But what began as an idea for permitting my own explorations and my own internal discovery has evolved to way into uh, a, a platform of more than 800 young people are full time into this, and hundreds of young, people, young boys and girls, men and women, in turn volunteer and pass through this organization to appreciate what we talk, immerse themselves into this uh, concept, and then go out much more capable of doing greater things in life. And I think it, all that we do is spark that faith in themselves. So to me, it's not an organization. But the organization also needs to exist so that we need to make sure that we are able to sustain to the extent determinable in perpetuity, right? And so uh, there's a framework, there's an institutional mechanism, and you need activities where people can explore themselves. You can't simply say there's a platform. And so we believe that the exploration is in human development. Because social change, uh, India is always civilizationally known for bringing about social change led by its own masses not driven by government, not driven by organizations, but by people and citizens themselves. And so we, I believe human development is not about hospitals, although I built hospitals, schools and all that, because having built them, I know that that's not development. So to me, development is the constant expansion of human capability. And how do we invest on human and social capital and build this capability in people, especially in young Indians? in people living in rural Bharat and make them believe that they can craft their own destiny. So you invest on human and social capital, it pays off enormously economically. The economic consequences are unbelievable. And so this platform, while on one side providing opportunities for young people to discover that, creates a space where they can also explore how they can invest on building their own human capital and also building human and social capital of communities around them and bring about change. So that is as, as briefly as I can talk about the organization. That was really interesting. Um, how was SVYM established? Did you do it alone or did you have some help? Who or what inspired you to start the initiative? Uh, it's very obvious that you guys have done your research and have taken a lot of effort to sit together and think through these questions. You know, uh, my discovery of Swami Vivekananda was accidental. And that's the honest truth. I was a very young, young, young person like any of you, 17 years old, uh, with simple middle, middle class aspirations. You know, I don't know, most of you are maybe first, second, uh, not, you're not really born in India, I suppose, and most of you have been born in the US. Um, your parents must have gone from here, my generation, or a little younger than me, your parents. Uh, that is an aspiration for most of us. Like we do engineering or medicine and we go abroad. So I was the youngest of three siblings in my family and my two older siblings are already, one is in the US, one is in California and one is in Canada. So coincidentally, people are from Canada and USA today. And so that is a, that is a sort of the aspirational trajectory for most Indian middle class people, right? And I was no different. I was only aspiring to possibly do that. And as a young man, uh, I used to participate in a lot of science programs during summer, like most of you kids also do, taking summer camps and stuff like that. Uh, and I was exposed to how a computer, those giant boxes, you know, in, in, a, in a very great institution in India called the Indian Institute of Science. And it's proud privilege for people like me that they just uh, got the number one status in research, just sort of scraping past MIT. And for people like me, it's a very proud and significant moment for all of us. And that institution, we were taken during the break in the summer camp to show computers. And that is a big room, you know, what our smartphones can hold today, that big hall built. And I was so inspired, I thought I got to get into this understanding computer science. And so there's, there are a set of institutions called the Indian Institute of Technologies that any young man's dream to get into. And I was also wanting to get into computer science in any of these IITs. What I didn't figure out is IITs were not ready to take me in. So I didn't qualify in entrance exams and I couldn't get in. But during those days, uh, nowadays you have entrance tests to write and call get into exams. But those days, uh, for the other than IITs, we, we had to just get into our marks that was scoring 12th grade, what you call senior high in your country. 
So I had an excellent percentage. I had a 99.67 percent. So I thought I could walk into any program I wanted. And I was horribly uh, let down when uh, in a great institution, Karnataka, those days called the regional engineering colleges. They were all very well known colleges. Now it's called the National Institute of Technology. I was waitlisted one for a computer science program. So so disappointed. I thought, what is this? Uh, I'm not getting what I want in life. How do I go abroad now if I don't get into good institutions, right? And then I just took some college, the state of Karnataka's department allotted to me. It was a call, the college called BMS College of Engineering in the city of Bangalore. I don't know if any of you are from Bangalore. Uh, all your parents are from Bengaluru, as it's called now. I went there and uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you must be familiar with the word hazing in your country. And in India, it was called ragging. I was very badly ragged on the first day. There. Now there's a law against ragging. Students can't indulge in it, they would be expelled. But those days, there was no law. A very violent way of for the senior students, um, I would say, abusing the younger students to join in. So after the first day, I never had the courage to go back to that school. And just beside the school down the street was the Ramakrishna Ashram. The gates were open, green campus. I thought I can't come home because my mother, would, she was a homemaker, and she could spot that I'm just whiling away time. Like most mothers are, all your mothers would be the same. They can always figure out if you guys are screwing up, right? And uh, my mother was no different. And so I thought, I can't go back home. I didn't have enough money to go sit in a movie theater. Now you guys don't even go to movie theaters. All you need is a smartphone and Netflix. Uh, but those days were different, right? We had actually go to a movie theater to watch a movie. And I was not knowing what to do. I thought, this is free. It doesn't cost me money. I can just go sit inside that campus. And I just strolled into the Ramakrishna Mission campus. And I'm sure you all heard of Swami Vivekananda, the great icon. His guru, Ramakrishna, on his name, this mission was set up by Swami Vivekananda. And I just went in, did spend a couple of days, and then I think the local monks there must have wondered, why is this young man coming every day? Maybe he's coming to steal fruits. And then just to make them believe that I'm very serious, I started getting into the library, started reading books. They must have thought, how oh, good investment, right? And that potential monk hood guy is coming into the campus. I started reading Swami Vivekananda's books and jokes apart. In the next two months, I pretty much read everything he wrote. And at 17, when you read these writings, you don't really understand much. I did. But all I knew was I had to do something different. Two small books that I think every young Indian, any Indian from Bharat should read. One is called To the Youth of India. And the other book he's written is his Call to the Nation. That inspired me. Sentences like, you know, I do not believe in a God or religion which cannot wipe away the widow's tears or bring a piece of bread to the orphan's mouth. I thought this is a God that I didn't have to get to know. At 17, I believe everyone is a socialist, a communist who wants to change the world, make it a better place. And when Swamiji's words hit me, I thought, I want to find that God which can help me do this. And then he writes another place, I call every young Indian, a, every young man a traitor who having been educated at people's expense pays not the least heed to them. So I thought, I can't be a traitor to my country. I'm being educated at public schools. I need to give back. So these kind of statements are Swami Vivekananda. I felt, he says, in another place, you just go from village to village, go to the fisherman's at the cobbler's school, stuff like that. So I thought, I, if I get a chance to do something different in life, this is what is my life going to be. Surprisingly, you may call it coincidence, but I call it a divine providence. Uh, that evening, I come back home the day, I felt extremely inspired. I come back home, my phone, and there's something, I don't know if you guys even know what a telegram is. You're all a generation where telegrams can only be seen in museums. But I got a telegram at home which said, join Mysore Medical College immediately. Uh, I thought this was something, uh, a divine message to me that my life is to be a doctor and do something different. I never wanted to be a doctor. So I just went there to do medicine. That was 1982. And a year or a year and a half later, I couldn't take it anymore. I said, I just can't hold on, I need to do something different. I need to start this organization. So I started speaking to a few friends and said, come on guys, we've got to be different. Vivekananda says, you are the maker of your own destiny. So I said, we need to build an institution which can take, at that point of time, my thinking was, how do you take, how do you make the practice of medicine and delivery of healthcare ethical, rational, and take it to rural India? Because 80% of doctors in India, some of your parents might be doctors, uh, take care of only 20% of India's population. We produce the world's highest number of doctors. It's unfortunate that most people uh, find uh, urban areas or uh, 
international arenas to practice, but we do really focus on rural India. So I thought this will be an organization which will make healthcare cost effective, which will make it a rational practice, which will bring an integrative practice of medicine where we practice our own Indian system for medicine along with what I've been trained in and take it to the masses of India. Vivekananda says, uh, you know, we have to care for the masses. He says, feel my children, feel, feel for the poor, the marginalized, the downtrodden. Feel till your heart, uh, your mind reels and your heart stops. That's the kind of power of feeling we need to generate. And I felt that way and I just went in and that's his history. Long story, but since you asked that question, I have to share it. Namaste. Uh, with this organization being around for the past almost 38 years, you probably had some really proud moments. So can you share one of those such moments? The proudest moments, uh, I'm, just, I'm just thinking there were several of them. There have been so many great moments, so many. Uh, I, I remember once, uh, many, many years ago, this was in 1996, it's already 20, 26 years ago. And you know, I went there thinking that I'm helping the tribals or I'm working with the tribals to take care of their interests. And then one of the days when I was there, um, uh, we had a struggle with the, with the police, with the forest department and with the state, uh, because they were, I believe that the laws that they ever tried to enforce were something not in favor of the indigenous communities that I was working with. And I was so fighting for the cause and the police had come down to arrest me. They didn't like what I was doing. And around two and a half thousand tribals, mostly women, surrounded me and said, till then the, the, the tribal would be very scared of what we call the khaki dress. Khaki is a brown uniform those people wear, right? And so they were always scared. When the forest department people came in khaki or the police officers came in khaki, they would run away. And I thought the women would run away when the police came, but they surrounded me. I was in the center and they told the police, you lay a hand on the doctor and we'll beat you up and walk with you to the police station and get arrested along with you. So I felt, oh my God, am I protecting them or are they protecting me? You know, this happened a long time ago, but there's something in me which said, uh, the love that they showed me is something different. And, uh, you know, you always think these people are poor, right? In one of my books, in Voices from the Grassroots, I wrote an article called Being Rich While Staying Poor. Uh, we have this mistaken notion that I am helping the poor, I've gone there to serve them, and they need my help. And this was a young tribal boy from the Jainapurva community, which is considered one of the most primitive tribal groups in India. And he was, uh, he brought his father-in-law for, his father-in-law was spraying uh, insecticides over cotton crop. They use a lot of weedy sides and insecticides. And while spraying it, he inhaled most of it. And he had uh, poison. He was suffering from organophosphorus poison, which is a poison of the insecticides. So they brought him to a hospital in very bad condition. Those days we didn't have a ventilator. And so we had to rush him to Mysore uh, for the reviving him and keeping him alive. The boy had no money and uh, most of the doctors there just put some money that they had, put together a thousand rupees, gave it to him, sent him in the ambulance to Mysore. And tribal don't have much money to repay that money. So nobody even thought that, nobody even expected it as a loan, to get as a gift to send him off to Mysore. Two, three months later, this young man walks into my office at the hospital. And, and Chenu Kurbas are very shy people. They don't talk too much. They, he came to me and said, uh, I want to give you this thousand rupees back. Now, I was shocked. First of all, I was wondering why did he even want to give it back? And then he said, my father-in-law survived. Thanks to your thousand rupees. Those his thousand was a big amount of money. And he's now back home and he's doing well. And I last three months, I've been working to save this thousand rupees. And I want to give it back. And he said, what do you mean give it back? You need this more than the hospital does. And we don't need it. And he said, no, it's not about you. I Tomorrow, if some other person like me comes to the hospital, and uh, he should not suffer from not having this money. So keep this money with you. And when another tribal needs it, use it on him. You know, this is being rich, right? And I've been so proud of him. He's now grown into a big man. So there's several such moments. And I would say, read my books. I've, I've written all this in the stories. And these are extraordinary people. And we need to believe that it's not Western education that can teach us a lot, but typical traditional community wisdom, 
whether it is embedded in communities in the United States or in India. It is rich of this community wisdom, taking pride in it, taking pride in what Bharat can teach us beyond the romanticization of it. Even taking a very scientific view and an empirical view to what all this the knowledge that is already embedded in our country. And I think that is that is what the world needs today. And it is these people have taught me that. They've given me back the pride in the community wisdom. Thank you. Uh, how do you feel this organization has changed over the years and what changes do you still hope to make? Well, Ashton, you have done a lot of business. The organization has changed. Nothing is static, right? All of you guys grow up and then you possibly, I've seen, I teach at Cornell and I know that when my students join undergrad, uh, they want to do, they want to major in anthropology and suddenly by the time they graduate, they majored in data sciences. And, and things change and all of you discover new things. Organizations are also like that. It has a life of its own. And organizations like the SPYM responds to people and their needs, community and their expressed needs. So as community and society's needs grow in response to that, our organizational needs also have to expand. And we need to also be uh, respond to those needs. And so what started off as just an organization providing rural people with quality health care, and soon I realized that these people needed more than healthcare. They were not really worried about being sick. Being sick just meant losing one day's wages for them. So, but they needed education to understand something more deeper. And then I thought we need schools for them. Then I thought it's not just that, they need livelihoods. They need to have a meaningful, dignified uh, way to earn their living. After some time, I discovered that why are they poor in the first place? They were never poor. So the state in its own ignorance made rules which made them poor. And so I thought we should fight the state and, and restore this the, 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 the situation where these rules were not really uh, were not really applicable to these people. So make make those changes and fight for that. After some that time, I became a very uh, confrontational activist. But then I realized there's no point fighting the government because government is the most powerful, most permanent thing anywhere in any country. It is my responsibility as an Indian citizen to educate my own government. So I took on the responsibility of trying to tell them what to do. And then I felt, why are these people still poor? So I've been here for 20 years. I've been doing this. Why aren't they do, doing better in life? Maybe I'm not, I'm not doing the right stuff. So I thought, let me discover what it is. And I thought, how do I discover it? Maybe if I go to Harvard and study there, I can do it. So I came to Harvard, did my master's. And I discovered maybe Harvard doesn't have answers to my questions, but it helped me ask questions better. So I asked to ask those questions to myself, to people around me, and that's why my, my books are all manifestation of that community wisdom. That's why my respect for community wisdom came. I thought the answers are there with people. We just know how to ask it. We need to trust them, we need to ask them, because we presume that poor people are also ignorant, right? We don't expect them to know things. So that's a mistake I made too. Then I realized, no, that's not what it is, and we can learn so much from them. So every time I discovered something, the organization evolved into something better. And today we have so many young people and they've all grown, evolved, and they're leading the organization today. And as they respond to community needs, they become better. And today we believe we need to discover newer ways of empowering citizens to build their voices. So my conviction today is India doesn't have a problem of income poverty anymore. It might be there, but it's less, much less than 10% today. The last few years, the government has done so much for people that it has already done quite a bit. But what India needs, is to fight voice poverty. And these are real voices of the people, the community, the people who matter. The traditional voices of wisdom needs to come out. And so we are now discovering how to do it. So we have institutions which have evolved out of that. We have an institute called the Vivekananda Institute for Leadership Development, where we believe young people should be trained to lead such initiatives. They need to understand how to do it. And we have an institute for young Indians like you people. We have around 30 universities around the world where kids come down from their undergrad and grad students come down and they understand India. So it's called the Vivekananda Institute of Indian Studies, where we believe India's knowledge should be shared with the rest of the world. That is what is being the Vishwa Guru and Jagat Guru Vivekananda Tansipa. And so we have evolved along with those kind of needs. And uh, one of the evolutions is also Gram. We felt that we, can't, we can only do this much in Karnataka, but the whole country has to change, only the government can do it. So how do you impact policy? How do you get into the policy space? So one thing led to the other, and here I am. And tomorrow, if it means that setting up a university to capture community wisdom, maybe that will happen too.
Um, can you tell us more about the projects and how they're helping people? First of all, Nikhil, we don't help anybody. Vivekananda says, you will think that you can help anybody is blasphemy. All we do is try to serve people. You can't learn, there's a very famous saying of Swami Vivekananda. He says, uh, don't stand on a pedestal and say, here my poor man, take my five cents. Right? Consider yourself privileged that you are the instrument through which change is made to happen. And you know, the cow which gives birth to a calf knows how to give it milk. The God who created all of us knows how to take care of us. So we really can't help anybody. Our attitude is how do you recognize the divine spirit in every human being and serve them? So SVYM's motto is Shiva Jnane Jiva Seva, which means the knowledge of God should be called through service of man. And we see this as an extraordinary opportunity for us to evolve ourselves. So it's very selfish. It's just, I don't even say we are doing selfless service. That's what outside world says. But I know the truth. All we are doing is trying to evolve ourselves to this opportunity of service that God has given us. And we do many activities. Like when I said human capital, we believe human capital means when how do we define it? We define it as a constant expansion of capabilities in the domain of the physical, the cognitive, the emotional, and spiritual areas. Right? And by growing these capabilities, it should give you the agency to lead and sustain your life. Make your decision maker for yourself. So physical means we take care of health. We teach yoga in the villages. With all those are physical. Ensure that you get good food, clean air, clean drinking water to drink. All this is for the body, right? And then cognitive means intellectual inputs like schools, awareness programs, etc. Emotional is how do you build interpersonal, intrapersonal intelligences, how do you build social intelligence? How do you get them to relate to each other? How do you stop fighting with each other? How do you respect everybody else? Bring in peace and harmony. And spiritual means how do you practice self-inquiry? It's not, it's not about God. It's about knowing yourself. How do you discover the inner power within you to serve mankind? That's what we see as spirituality. So all our activities are around this. That's what our, we don't say we are running a hospital. We are building physical capital of people by making sure that if they're sick, they're immediately taken care of. They don't, they don't lose the physical capital. Our schools are for building cognitive capital, intellectual capital. We didn't just call it a school. We believe that we're building human capital in these institutions. And so that's how we frame it. So we run hospitals, we call healthcare programs, education programs, drinking water programs, sanitation programs. We have rural livelihood programs. We make people stand on their own feet, teach them agriculture, teach them from mushroom cultivation to beekeeping to uh, taking care of, you know, today, even rural India people want to be a beautician and beauty parlors and stuff like that. So we train our young women if they want to learn that, that's skill too. They need to become independent for themselves. So I have so many of my tribal kids. One of my tribal kids has become, become a lawyer and runs a very successful beauty clinic. And so you feel great pride, right? And then one of my young women became an engineer, so first engineer from the entire county, if you can call it, uh, equal to county in India, Satalu. And today she's working in the government and that's a proud moment. So we realize that investing on this human capital is one of my young kids is now uh, doing his PhD in IIT, right? So we feel very proud. These are proud moments too. Uh, all that is because we invest on in activities which do this. And so these are the different activities. We do it across the state of Karnataka. So we are headquartered in Mysore. We have operations around the state. We have offices in Bangalore. We have offices in Hassan. We have offices in this report. Darwad, which takes from northern Karnataka, which is very poor. And so we have across the state, and Karnataka is a big state. We also ask other, other people to come study with us, learn from us, and take this model to other states. So that, in that space, we are across India. And Gram does work across India. It's basically a research organization. So whichever state government with PUSA help, we go there and help them out. And it's mostly across India. Namaste. Uh, earlier in the interview, you mentioned how you could only do so much and the Indian government also needed to help with public policies. So you created Grimm to get into the public policy level. Uh, could you go into a bit more about why Grimm was created and what, uh, why did you feel like it was required? And was there any, uh, what was the motivation behind starting Grimm? Thanks, Nika, for that question. No, I was, when I was in Harvard, I realized that uh, I did a fellowship at Harvard, at a Kennedy school at Harvard. And 
one of my responsibilities was how do I combine my practitioner experience with uh, academic knowledge and see if man, uh, we can find solutions to mankind's problems. And that's where I realized academicians hold practitioners in contempt. They say, these idiots don't know anything. These guys are just wasting their time. If they only listen to us and read our research papers, they'll be better off. And the people on the ground, the practitioners, they believe that these academicians are absolutely ivory tower. They, they don't come down to the ground, they don't soil their hands, they have no idea what people need, and they simply sit there in their rooms and write their papers. Why can't they just listen to us and the problems we are trying to fight and solve and give us answers? So the truth is both are wrong, both are right. Right? And, uh, and there is a gap between the enormous academic knowledge that the university has built and the way it can be applied on the ground. So my job was to see how they combine it. And if I can say there's something in life I failed in, that is one thing I failed. I just couldn't get practitioners to communicate effectively to academicians and academicians to effectively solve the problems practitioners brought to them. But I thought, why is it like this? Why can't we just get two sets of people to talk to each other? What is the problem? Then I realized that's the exact problem in India too. People in the government sitting in Delhi or in state capitals think the poor people are people who can't even think for themselves. We know what they want. They're so poor, they can't even decide what they want. And we have answers for their problems. And they, they design programs and schemes that are outright stupid. And, you know, for example, I realized in the area where I was working, there's no sheep there. People can't even grow sheep because you have sheep in your house, the leopards and tigers will come and eat them anyway. So why would they even keep sheep? So it, never, it was never a need. But the government said, no, 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 we have to teach you sheep, sheep rearing as an activity. And how stupid can that be? When people, I, all, I had another program where the government came and told me, we need to teach tribals how to uh, repair your motors, your mixies and your uh, blenders and your fans. These guys have no blenders in the home or fans in the home. Why would you want to teach them how to repair it, right? Somebody sitting in Bangalore or Delhi decide that's what people need and decide like this. So I thought they need to understand this. The practitioners on the ground can tell them so much. So I thought, let me build a research agency. And many of us practitioners talk very emotionally. You know, I was also an emotional activist. Then I realized that's not going to work. We need to build evidence. We need to have uh, you know, proof to say what we are saying. So I thought, can I build a research organization where academic people with PhD degrees come and live in villages, understand the real needs of people before they start doing research on it and then find answers to problems or find answers to why solutions are not working and tell the government to make things better. So that's how the idea was uh, formed. And I call it grassroots research and advocacy movement because you do research at the grassroots at the bottom and you advocate for change with the state. And it can't stop. It's not a one day job. It has to be a movement. Maybe I love the word movement. That's why it's all you wake up a youth movement and grassroots research and advocacy movement. And, and that's how Gram was born. Thank you, Dr. Balu. It was very inspiring to hear how you came up with SVYM and Gram and were able to change many lives. But now we wanted to transition to more of a personal question. Were there any difficulties that you faced as you carved ways to follow your passion? Who was your inspiration? And I know that you touched upon some of your Vekananda, but if you could elaborate on some more personal experiences you had with him. See, obviously, any work like this is not going to be easy to do, right? You know, Swami Vivekananda himself says, all good work has to go through three stages, he says. First comes ridicule. And when I started, people ridiculed me. I was a young 17-year-old, and then I was 19 when I started the organization. And people, what can you do? You, you don't even have a properly grown mustache. How are you going to change people's lives? You never lived in, I never lived in a village. I lived all my life in Bangalore and then in Mysore and suddenly go into the forest. I said, you never be seen a village. You'll never survive for two days. And people made fun of me. People ridiculed me. And Vivekananda says, if you have three things, purity, patience, and perseverance, you'll be able to negotiate this ridicule. And the next stage is opposition. People beat me. People jailed me. And this is, if you still persevere and say, I'm not going to let go of my beliefs, then comes acceptance. The very fact that you keep just talking to me, it still shows that my work has been accepted, right? Otherwise, why would you waste a Friday evening um, when you're supposed to be having fun and going out and traveling with families on a weekend to ask these questions and understand what social change making is, which means this is accepted to me. 
So uh, people have problems. And then this actually, my inspiration comes apart from Swami Vivekananda, Mahatma Gandhi. The, the SVYM's values, we say are four, two, all four are Vedantic values, but two articulated by Gandhi and two articulated by Swami Vivekananda. Vivekananda says the two national ideals of India should be Tyaga and Seva, sacrifice and service. And Mahatma says, we all have to practice Ahimsa and Satya, right? So we say our values are Ahimsa, Satya, Seva and Tyaga. But in real life, my two great inspirations have been two gurus I was fortunate to have. One monk was called Swami Achalananda, who shaped my thinking, my life, and the, you know, my great mentor and guide in the spiritual space, who taught me all the spiritual wealth of India, all the, whether it's the Bhagavad Gita to Viveka Chodamani to Upanishads, he was the one who introduced me to all of them. And in the practical space, another monk for the Ramakrishna order called Swami Sureshananda, who told me how you could actually practice spirituality in a secular world. And you can still be, you know, like Ramakrishna says, be a lotus leaf in water, but not be wetted by it. And so he taught me how to do this. So these were great inspirations. But more than that, the, the several tribal chieftains with whom I have been privileged to walk along and talk and live my life for nearly 25 years with them have been great teachers, their own way of tradition is so. That is why when I look, whether it's either citizen or the book, the leadership lessons or in voices from the grassroots, they're all loaded with stories and inspirational messages that I got from these people, right? And so everybody is a guru in their own way. And so these are all several inspirational, uh, real life characters in my life, my mind. And then they're not just these people, there's several people around the world. And I want to give an example of one person. And we don't really, only later on in life, when you reflect on it, you realize how inspiring they are. So people look at my work and they think that I'm doing all this, but it's not true. Several people are involved in this. And I remember one person, long time ago, I'm talking of 30, 35 years ago, I got those days in India, there's something called a money order in the postal department. You can send money to the post office in what is called a money order. And it would be a small piece of white paper would come to you and who sent it to you and all that. And the postman would hand over the money to you. And I would get 10 rupees a month. Then it became 20 rupees a month. The person who was sending it to me, I didn't even know him. He had read about me somewhere and he used to send it by post. And I used to send him a receipt every month for the money he gave. Then one, three, four months later, I got a message in the money order. Please don't miss send me a receipt every month. I am a postman working in the department. So sending money for me is free. But for you to post the letter, it cost you 15 paise those days. So you're wasting 15 paise of the 10 rupees I'm giving you for sending me a receipt. So send me one receipt at the end of the year. Don't send me every month so you can save money. And then suddenly after eight or 10 years of sending me 20 rupees, one month I got 50 rupees. I was surprised. Why suddenly, what did he do? Why did he give me 30 rupees more? And then he wrote in the message, I got an increment of 30 rupees. I don't need it. So I thought that you might put it to better use. So I wanted to just pass it on to you. Now, what an inspirational thought that is. How many of us think that way, right? The entire amount that we got, we always think we need to keep something for ourselves and what is left over is for charity. But this man said, I give away what I can for charity and then what is left over is for myself. These are the inspirational people who, you know, the, the, the experience I mean, I remember continue to inspire. You guys are asking some wonderful questions also. Uh, namaste. Um, I'm going to ask the next question. But before that, I just wanted to say that your story of transformation is very unique from whatever I've seen before. And it's been really interesting to learn about you. And the person who sent you those, uh, the money in the letters, I think that was a really, really amazing thing to do. Yeah. Um, so transitioning away from uh, mentors and inspirations and trans and going back into SUIM and Grom, I wanted to ask, what is your favorite project? I know that projects have been done across many different disciplines, but do you happen to have a favorite project out of them? Uh, one of my favorite projects was a project we ran for women and children. It's called the Reproductive Child Health Project. It was an 18-month project funded by the World Bank. And uh, it was one of the most pro professionally run projects in my life by me. 
when we started, the number of women delivering in hospitals was less than 2%. Uh, immunization, less than 8%, I think that the immunization rate was less than 2% or the numbers are reversed. And, and women die during labor for five major reasons. So they needed to be in a hospital. And there was a forest, no cell phones, no electricity. Either. So we actually used to work uh, as good as a 911 that we created ourselves. We had small uh, wireless handsets and we trained tribal girls to be people who could recognize a problem in the villages. They would wireless a message into the hospital and our ambulance would rush, pick up a pregnant lady and come back. In 18 months, by the time we finished this project, the women who were delivering uh, less than 2% of the hospitals was close to 40%. Children who are 8% vaccinated were 80% vaccinated by then. And then when you look back, you realize it made a huge difference to maternal mortality and child mortality. So these were very satisfying moments. Satisfying moments like, you know, one of the one of the Jenukumba girls, uh, I used to call her Chikuti, uh, and she called us in Manjula. And so a little one, a real, a real darling of mine. And uh, she was my greatest challenge. Every time, uh, and I used to love the school, I used to be there most of the time, never in the hospital much. And this kid would run away from school every time. So I would go chasing her and she would make my life miserable and she would get through the bushes in the forest and I could never do that and I would be scratched and bleeding in all places and drag her back and she, I would actually joke and drag her back to school and much later she told me, you never caught me. I allowed myself to get caught. She was I saw you were bleeding and thought this poor man is struggling so much that he get caught. It might be true also. And that end lady uh, was great in art. And somehow she finished the school. She, she, she topped the school by that we completed 10th grade. She, great, she became an art teacher in my own school. She completed the arts program, a bachelor's program, came back, became an art teacher. Then went back to the city of Mysore, became an art teacher and found a great partner that got married, had kids. And eight or 10 years later, she calls me one day and says, I know I used to trouble you when I was a child in school. Now I'm troubling you to get my kids admission into good schools. I want to make sure my children don't trouble their teachers, but they go to school correctly. And so you feel so warm and nice. And even today, uh, she sees herself as my daughter and whenever she has a problem, she'll call me and say, you better help me out. She'll demand my help. She'll not even ask for it. Sort of you know, like an entitled daughter, she would speak and ask me. So you feel these are, these are touching moments. So you feel very proud. You guys are making me remember my past. Okay, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for your in-depth responses and this is a great learning opportunity for all of us. Uh, I just wanted to uh, talk about how we, you've told us about how uh, Gram and SYVM have served many people and I want to further touch on more of the background drives or psychological aspects of uh, something that could have encouraged you to follow this path of service. So uh, referring to that, I was to, I was going to ask if you could tell us more about the environment you were raised in and did the environment play an important role to your mindset and did it play some type of role for making a change in this world? Talking to my parents? Uh, just the overall environment around you. But yeah, I think I, I was privileged to be in middle class. You know, where, where you're not too privileged that you don't think of the underprivileged. And you're not so underprivileged that you only think of survival. Vivekananda himself says, my faith is in the middle class of India. And thankfully, God put me in a place where I had great parents, I had great siblings, and my parents' only belief was education is the only answer. And so keeping that, when I, they came from very poor families. And so for them, education would be the way out of poverty. And that's what we grew up with. And... Um, my values were shaped by my mother and the story she told me and the way she brought me up and the values of ethics and giving back to society and public service are shaped by my father. So unlike most people um, think, my parents never stopped me from doing what I was doing. Never for a day my father said, don't go do this, you got to earn money and take care of yourself. He only told me, you're such a great student. I was a student who graduated with distinction in medicine and so he thought I would go into my master's program immediately. But instead, I went into the forest. He said, don't go. He didn't say that. He said, go, but can you complete your master's too and then go? It will be more useful. And uh, till he died, he lived with me. 
So that shows his conviction and faith in about what I was doing. So I was fortunate. I was also fortunate as the youngest of two siblings because I didn't have to be burdened with worrying about family and taking care of parents and all that. So I, I just grew with the liberty that I could do what I wanted to do and they let me do what I wanted. It's very rare in typical Indian middle class societies in the generation that I belong to where one grows up with that privilege. So it was great privilege to me. My teachers and uh, people were also extraordinary. And I was fortunate I came in contact with monks of the Ramakrishna order, right? Who are extraordinarily selfless people who believed, who not only believed in their spiritual welfare, but they also believed in societal welfare. So that's a philosophy that appealed to me. And like I said, these two monks who shaped and guided me created in me this, uh, gave me a set of toolkit where I could grow spiritually and also a toolkit where I could serve society. And I think all this put together, and I also belong to a generation of young people around me who believed in what I was talking and saying, and they joined me. Without all the hundreds of young people who worked with me, uh, I don't think we could have done so much. I may get the credit, but I think it is not uh, the credit just for me, it's for all the hundreds of young men and women who joined me, and that ecosystem shaped what I am today. So it's been, it's been in a sense, a, a great generation to belong to where the distractions were not there. I didn't have Facebook, I didn't have Instagram, I didn't have to worry about looking into my phone the whole day. I, could, I never even had a cell phone in my generation, right? It's only the last few years we have all that. So you're all grown up in that. But we, we, we just had nothing else except our studies or sports and fun and games and, and then do what we were supposed to do. Today, you people have got so many opportunities to choose from, so many distractions to worry about and so many reasons to focus on something. For us, we had very little to worry about focusing because there's nothing to focus on except a few things. It is easy. And I really believe that your generation is much more challenged and therefore it's much more difficult for you people to do what some of us did. I don't know if that satisfies you one shikha, but that's what I think. Yes, thank you. So to continue on with the child, the topic of childhood. How good of a student were you academically or in extracurricular activities? Come again, Aditi. So to continue on with the topic of childhood, how good of a student were you academically or in extracurricular activities? I was considered to be at the top of my class. I always used to come first in class. And, uh, I love football. In fact, uh, I hurt my knees badly playing football. And I grew up with that. but. I used to play a game called Kabaddi. It's a very traditional Indian sport and football a lot. And no Indian can grow up without playing cricket, right? Cricket on the streets of those days, traffic would be hardly visible. So we'd always be on the streets every evening. And for us, the street lights came on. That's the time you go back home. Right? And so I, I used to love playing cricket, football, and Kabaddi. And, and weekends, uh, I used to be an avid cyclist. So we would all friends would come together, take a box of curd rice. In Canada, we call it Masrana. And a little pickle and then cycle some 30, 40 kilometers away or 20 miles in your language. And then eat it. That, we do nothing. Just slightly 20 miles, find an open ground, sit there, eat it. Come back. So that's the fun of cycling. And so we had, we had to discover and make fun with what little we had. And that is a joy of growing up. So I was a good student. You can say that I did very well in academics. After all, I found my way to Harvard, so I must have been good. Yeah, that was very, yeah, I think curd rice plays a huge role in everyone's childhood. Um, going back to childhood, you mentioned a bit that you played kabaddi and cricket and football. Can, um, what are some of your favorite childhood memories? And do any of them like influence you even now? One of my favorite memories, not favorite in a sense, but a great learning moment for me, which has kept me on my track all my life, is a lesson I learned from my mother. As an young boy, I think I was 12 or 13 years old, you know, in Indian schools outside, you have this street vendors with, who sell sweets and ice cream and fruits and stuff like that. Where during the break, you go there, you have 10 paise or 25 paise with you, go buy stuff. This guy was selling govas and uh, they would cut it and put salt and give you. And I don't know if you guys have seen all that when you come to India. 
and I was very tempted to get a goa, but I didn't have money. So I there's a big crowd from the street vendor, and I managed to see, steal a nice little big goa. And I put it in my bag and came home and I proudly told my mother, listen, I have a great big goa with me. And, and I thought I could proudly tell her how I got it. I said, I stole it from the street vendor without even knowing about it, how good I must be in this. And my mother was shocked. She didn't say anything. I could see the disappointment on her face. She All she said was, she didn't say anything. And for me, suddenly it hit me, I'm a sudden something wrong. She's not enjoying what I did. She's not celebrating it. She's not saying, great son, you did a great thing. And I was, I realized something has gone wrong. So I thought if this, if this woman at least beats me up and so shouts at me, I feel like I know I've done something wrong. She's not saying anything. And I saw her eyes were moist and she was nearly crying. And she said, I'm so sorry I have to, I must have done something wrong that I have a son like this. That really hurt me. I said, what did I do wrong? After all, I'm so good at it. I stole a stole goa and she said, be happy and cut it and give it to me back. And then she said, you think about it. And she just left. And next morning, the goa was still with me. I had not eaten it. I didn't know what to do. I was not sure. I knew something is wrong. And when you're 12, 30, you can't figure it out also. Next morning, my mother said, well, uh, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to beat you. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to ask you to go back to the goa center. Say, I'm sorry I stole from you give it back to him, apologize to him and come back. Now, I wish I was beaten and punished by her, grounded by her, but she didn't do all that. Going back to somebody you stole from and telling him I stole this from you and giving it back can be very painful and scarring. Right? So I remember it because it scarred me. I went back to him, I told him, but what he told me is what inspired me. He said, I ne can never believe that you're actually coming back. I never knew you stole from He's not going to miss it. Hundred foods there, you take one. Who's going to miss it? But there is, he told me, there is a future for this country as long as there are mothers like yours. And that keeps reminding me that I shouldn't ever leave the path of truth and honesty. So every time I think there's an opportunity to be dishonest, I tell myself, no, my path is however difficult, however inconvenient it is, however challenging it is, my path is path of truth and honesty, and I'm not going to let it go. I just cannot afford to see that pain on my mother's face. My mother is just a representation on any human being's face by my being dishonest. So I will not be. That has kept me going. Like I said, you kids are making me remember all my life. Good. Um, now that you've talked a little bit about your childhood, I'm going to go more into the... Uh... Early in the interview, you said that you used to hide in the Ramakrishna mission and skip school and college and all that. So do you think that it was fate or destiny that led you there or some type of like um, superior force that made you sit in the library and read all the books? I just don't think I know and I'm convinced that it was that force which guides my life every day. Everything I've done, I don't think I can say I did it. It's always getting done through me. So what I'm doing today, uh, possibly working in a position, working with the government at a very high level, with the Honorable Prime Minister, an extraordinary human being, and trying to do what it like can uh, for this country. I believe it's all ordained and controlled by a divine force, which our life's mission is to understand discover. And so I don't even think that I've been led by it. I think every act that is getting done through me is already pre-planned and driven by a higher force. Maybe just because I understand it doesn't mean the force has to be exist. And my life's journey is to figure it out. And that's what spirituality means to me. Um, we're skipping a few questions for uh, because we're running out of time. But what advice would you give to someone who is struggling to bring out their leadership skills? Come again, come again, Nikhil. Um, what advice would you give to someone who is struggling to bring out their leadership skills? The greatest gift you can give any other human being is the gift of faith in himself. Getting a person, just telling a person, you don't have to follow anybody. You don't have to depend on somebody else's books or somebody else's uh, writings, but just have faith in yourself. And that is the greatest leadership you can exercise. Just believe in yourselves. 
believe you can and you will. Thank you for telling us such a good message. Um, in an interview for TEDx, you said that leadership is not always leading a certain group or community, but it is about the self and what you are willing to die for. How did you come to this realization? I think my own life's journey where uh, if you believe in a purpose that is much bigger than you and it's all about society, so there are two, two things which um, drives me to believe that. One is in, in a letter to the Maharaja of Mysore, Swami Vivekananda writes, the vanities of life are transient, but he alone lives who lives for others. So that message struck me. And what does living for others mean? And then in another place, I realized in the Bhagavad Gita itself, Bhagavad Gita is one endless quest for self-discovery, where you discover yourself by the punyana or through karma or through bhakti. And in karma, it's about doing work for others. And I, I would always ask myself, how does working for others help me understand myself? And then we realize what Gandhi said, you know, you discover yourself in the service of others. And when I started thinking through this on my own life's experience, I realized leadership is just that. Leadership is about understanding yourself, what you want out of life, why are you doing what you're doing, understanding others around you, and the actions that bind you to the others. If the others could be your parents, it could be your siblings, it could be your close friends, it could be society, it could be people living around you. So the journey of leadership begins with the journey of understanding yourself, understanding those around you, and what the actions that bind you to the others. And if you really figure this out, there will be so much peace, contentment, harmony, and everything good for everybody, right? And the world will have to be a better place. And that's why my convictions are driven conceptually from this, experientially from my own life's experiences. And when I started teaching this, my students around the world were now in high places. Some of them have become ministers and CEOs in a lot of places. And when they share their life's experiences, they keep coming back to me and saying, you know what, what you thought is what makes sense today. It took us a long time to figure this out, but as we start living our lives and start placing it in the context in which you taught us, I think that's what matters to us. So the, my, the experience gets revalidated. And that is when I felt maybe these things have to be captured and that's the leadership book I did. I think we have reached the end of the interview. It's an hour now. Such a pleasure talking to all of you. So much I learned from the questions you guys asked. Banerjee, um, to wind up, maybe uh, if you want to uh, give us some message to the youth and teenagers uh, that they want to carry. Uh, I just think, don't limit yourselves. Don't leave your lives with a do and don't list. Just live your life to be authentic, to be yourselves. Every moment of your life, it's time for young Indians from Bharat, not just to think of Bharat, but to take Bharat's message to the rest of the world. The message of service, the message of what we can, the Sastyaga and Seva. And our message is no longer restricted to just our country. The message of Bharat should reach every village in the world, every city in the world, every nook and corner. And you are those messengers. So every day of your lives, ask yourselves, what is the Bharatiyata in me? which I can share with the rest of the world. And the more you do that, that's what India needs. India's story is not an emotional story to be told to the rest of the world. It's a lived experience that the world has to understand, to discover itself. And in that discovery, the world will actually be a better place. That's all I would say. Thank you, Prabhupada. Yeah, thank you so much for your time thank and welcome us through your journey of transformation. Uh, we were really inspired by your stories and um, thank, we're so proud of you for serving many people. Thank you so much. And I'm glad Nikhil from help by the end of the interview you shifted to serve. Yeah, that's what I really learned. Thank you so much for learning that one. And see you all, wish you all the very best in whatever you do in life and hopefully our paths will cross in time. Okay, namaste.